Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here and honor to have been invited to give this lecture. Uh, once I started working on it, and Marcus really did sort of want me to talk on sovereign debt, I began worrying about the fact that I'd accepted it. Um, first off, what I want to do is to pull together several things that need to be pulled together for an understanding of the whole problem. But the trouble with that mean is that it means cutting across a number of fields, macro, finance, other aspects. And in a sense, I'm going to do this as a jack of all trades, and I think there is no part of this where there won't be at least one person and probably many more in this audience who know more about it than I do. So it's a very difficult thing to put together, and we'll see how it goes. Uh, as you know, in the past several years, the world's watched in surprise and dismay at the difficulties in the Euro area. Although Iceland, which is not a member of the Eurozone, had experienced problems earlier, attention began to focus on the Euro area's problems uh, when, when Ireland, not Iceland, encountered major difficulties. But it was the eruption of the Greek crisis and situation and recognition of its severity that led to the most consternation and the beginning of an ongoing debate and discussion. By early 2011, as you know, Portugal was joining Greece and Ireland as Euro area countries, confronting major economic difficulties, requesting and receiving external support from EU countries, the ECB, and the International Monetary Fund. Spain and Italy were soon seen as potential <coughs> crisis candidates, and that worry has persisted. Meanwhile, Cyprus has now requested support from the IMF in an amount greater than that accorded in the largest IMF support package prior to the problems of the Eurozone. We're in a different world. Many characteristics of the difficulties faced by the gypsies, Greece, Italy, Portugal, Spain, Ireland, and gypsy is just a sort of had confronted other countries in earlier years. One need think back no further than the Asian crises of 1997-98, or the Russian, Turkish, and Argentine, and Uruguayan crises at the beginning of this century, well, Russia was really last century, to recognize some major similarities. And those crises followed on many more in earlier decades, including especially the debt crisis of the 1980s, which involved many emerging markets, especially in Latin America. But other features of the situation in Europe were quite different, and they have accounted for much of the initial surprise and focus on the Euro area. First and foremost, the afflicted Euro area countries were not regarded as emerging markets. Conventional wisdom had been, at least by the year 2000, that financial crises were something to which emerging markets, and only emerging markets, uh, were subject, and the industrial countries, by definition, almost didn't have them. The IMF had not provided support nor entered into a program with any industrial country since the 1970s, when the Eurozone crisis broke out. It was thought that they'd become immune. While low-income countries have also encountered difficulties, it was, largely correctly, thought that those problems were different, involving, as they did, mostly official credits. Secondly, until shortly before recognition of Greece's difficulties, Markets and analysts that regarded the countries of the Euro area as if they were virtually one for, for financial purposes. Spreads on Greek government bonds were little above those in Germany's, despite recognition of the much stronger economic and financial position of Germany. <coughs> Implicitly, it was thought either that the stronger economies of Europe would stand behind the weaker ones, or that even the weaker ones would always take the necessary actions to maintain their standing within the Euro area by adjusting their domestic policies. Thirdly, until the gypsies encountered difficulties, there had been a relatively standard formula, about which I'll say more later, with which the international community, largely under the aegis of the IMF, addressed the problems raised by crises in emerging markets. There were three, and sometimes four, parts. For the country in difficulty, the formula entailed, first, an adjustment of domestic policies that were deemed to have contributed to the crisis, and second, an adjustment of the exchange rate. The third part then consisted of financial support for the country from the international community, again, usually under the leadership of the IMF, as the country undertook policy reforms which would take time to take hold and stop the bleeding. On some occasions, a fourth part, and the one that the title of my talk is about, focused on partial or total restructuring of a country's sovereign debt and sometimes of its total debt. But to get there, we have to cover some of these other issues. Membership of the euro area effectively precluded exchange rate adjustment and loss of control over monetary policy uh, in the, um, for the countries in the eurozone. Hence, a large component of the adjustment package that had been used in earlier crisis situations 
was not comparably available to the gypsies. Controversy over virtually all aspects of the Euro area difficulties has been unabated since its onset. Issues have included the degree of austerity imposed on the gypsies, what euro or the gypsies are under programs, what euro what ECB monetary policy should have been and should be, whether sovereign debt of the euro governments could be in or should be restructured, how banking issues including capital flight should be handled, and many more. To a degree, these controversies arise because the world is in uncharted territory and we simply do not have enough understanding of or data concerning the issues to reach definitive conclusions. But a considerable amount of the controversy appears to arise because of the failure of public understanding, at least as it is reflected in popular and financial presses. It is some of these issues that I'll address today. There are, it seems to me, two serious failures of understanding which cloud discussions of sovereign debt and policy options for the Euro area, the ECB, the IMF, the Gypsies, and more generally the world, if, as, and when, as they surely will, other crises elsewhere happen in the future. The first is the failure to comprehend the necessity for macroeconomic adjustment as a critical part of any policy package designed to enable a country to return to a stable <coughs> macroeconomic and growth path and restore creditworthiness. The second is the insufficient recognition of the implications of debt unsustainability for future growth and financial stability for the country in or countries in question. The two issues are interrelated, and it's necessary to understand the macroeconomic issues first. Thereafter, I'll turn attention to issues of debt sustainability or lack thereof. And then I will conclude with some considerations regarding the adequacy and optimality of the international economic architecture for minimizing the losses associated with the measures to address financial crises and their consequences. Before starting, I should note that there are many sorts of sovereign obligations. Sovereigns may borrow from foreign or domestic banks. They may issue bonds to foreigners or domestic residents in foreign currency or in domestic currency. And they may issue bonds in domestic currency, usually but not always to domestic residents, although if the currency is convertible, this distinction does not much matter. But I'm going to only speak of debt and not get into these unless the context requires it. I could spend a lot of time short-term debt, long-term debt, and a whole variety of other public, private, official, uh, etc. but I won't do so. So let me turn to the need for macro adjustment, which is, I think, the place that we have to start. A country can be at risk of a financial crisis for any number of reasons. There may have been a sustained period of overly expansion, mon expansionary monetary and fiscal policy. That would have been reflected in current account and or fiscal deficits and resulting accumulating sovereign debt obligations. There may have been a significant change in the country's external environment, such as, as a sharp drop in the price of a major export, oil for example, to which insufficient attention or adjustment in public and private investment and savings was made with a consequent buildup of inflationary pressures and usually with an inadequate exchange rate adjustment so that the real exchange rate has become overvalued and the current account deficit has increased beyond the amount that the initial drop in export prices entailed. Current account deficits and rising costs of borrowing from abroad result and accumulate. Private banks may have been too far too lax in extending credit with a buildup of non-performing loans threatening the banking system. Economic dislocation may have resulted from armed conflict or natural disaster. The factors leading to financial difficulties can be any one of these or any combination of them, but they have in common that macroeconomic adjustment was needed and not yet undertaken, and that the status quo ante of policies can persist only with accumulating private and public debt and rising inflation rates, and even then it cannot continue when the ability to borrow is finally uh, exhausted. For the sake of exposition, let me assume that a country is experiencing one of these macroeconomic pressures which, if not corrected, will lead to a crisis, which I'll again still define later. Let me further assume that for political reasons, policymakers are failing to take the measures that could, be, could correct the situation even though, for a period of time, it would be correctable. In that circumstance, sustained expansionary pressures will be anticipated <coughs> and people in the country and in the rest of the world will want to shift out of assets in that country and that country's currency and to hold foreign assets whose expected return is higher because of the lack of safety and assurance of the domestic the obligations of the sovereign and of the nationals in the country will be honored. 
Meanwhile, it's usually the case that the nominal exchange rate does not adjust sufficiently to maintain the real exchange rate, so the current account deficit rises, which is the counterpart of the inflationary <coughs> pressure and so on. And despite the current account deficits and fiscal deficits, the country borrowing requirements are, of course, rising, uh, perhaps after a period when foreign exchange reserves have been run down. These financing needs can generally be met, if at all, only at higher and higher spreads and in interest rates. Moreover, existing obligations, and this is often forgotten, must be rolled over, which can happen only at higher cost, and is normally the breaking point for a crisis when a country must roll over its debt and cannot do so because nobody will buy even at very high interest rates because they don't think they'll ever get their money back. As time passes, the debt to GDP ratio and the debt to export ratio rises. Debt serving costs increase because of the large volume of outstanding obligations and because of the rising interest rates. At some point, if earlier policy adjustments haven't been made, uh, creditors become unwilling to roll over the obligations, as I said, and the authorities must either default, which has huge economic costs in the short run, or they must take corrective measures. <clears throat> It will not generally be the case that the country can persist in expansionary policies until such time as it can no longer do so. Why? Because once economic agents recognize the high likelihood that the authorities won't change policies and that future expansionary measures will continue, <coughs> their actions will bring about the crisis as they sell domestic assets and capital flight, and as foreigners get out of domestic currency and into foreign currency, thereby also, by the way, reducing the bank's equity. While this will not happen all at once, increasing capital outflows, which may lead the authorities to permit some increase in interest rates, a reduced outlook for exports, and efforts to bring imports forward, and foreign sales of domestic assets will bring on an unsustainable situation, even when underlying fundamentals may be such that prompt action could still reverse the situation. If creditors do not believe such action will be undertaken, uh, the hand of the authorities can be forced. To provide a concrete illustration, Japan's sovereign debt is over 220% of GDP, and the fiscal deficit is over 6% of GDP, and the economy is subject to deflationary pressure, so prices are falling. Yet to date, this has not brought any significant increase in pressures on the Japanese authorities. Interest rates are close to zero, yet the debt is almost entirely domestically held. The reason in that case is that, to date at least, observers and analysts seem to believe that the Japanese government will change course before things get totally out of hand, and the Japanese domestic residents will be willing to continue uh, acquiring uh, the, the Japanese sovereign debt. Of course, should the outlook for government behavior change drastically and everyone become convinced, or be gradually become convinced, that indeed uh, the Japanese authorities will not correct the situation, uh, then at least we could see another crisis in that part of the world. But at least until now, expectations of sovereign debt continue to be that it will be honored as has prevailed in the past, so there's no crisis. But there are a large number of countries that have undergone expansionary macroeconomic policies and inflation for sustained periods in the past without making the necessary adjustments, and they've been confronted with, confronted with sharply rising real interest rates when they attempt to roll over a sell due debt as the as likelihood of policies being corrected will diminish. And it's surprising how much the, his, the macroeconomic history of the country in terms of its willingness uh, to adjust as needed makes a difference to how much latitude the authorities have as to their time of adjustment and the amount. The time during which spreads are rising and the situation is deteriorating depends on a number of factors, uh, including the severity of the correction needed <coughs> in the country and, of course, the likelihood of the correction will be undertaken. That, in turn, implies that the initial situation in one crisis-threatened country may be very different from that in another. An example of this was the contrast between Brazil and Argentina in the 1970s, 1980s, and the early 1990s. Brazil, hist historically, had not defaulted on its debts nor, and when it had it preserved the banking system and had not imposed capital controls to contain capital outflows, while well, Argentina had. The result was, in roughly similar circumstances, a significant capital fight happened in Argentina and was a major early triggering point for events, where there was much less in Brazil and there was much more time to undertake adjustments. Brazil ultimately faced crisis anyway, but the period during which correction could have been made was longer. Uh, likewise, countries can take corrective action in time and they can avert crises. It's not inevitable. 
Latvia, for example, was in confronted with an unsustainable situation in 2007 to 2008. The country, however, opted for what they called an internal devaluation, under which civil servants' wages were sharply decreased, private wages fell, government spending was drastically reduced, and other measures were taken. The Lats had tied their currency to the euro. Many of them had mortgages already denominated in euro, and as a result of which, there was very little political pressure for devaluation and strong objections. So they did the necessary internally rather than face the external situation. But regardless of the price, precise situation at the time when spreads are rising and capital outflows are beginning to mount, the lesson is clear. Policies that address the underlying reasons for the macroeconomic imbalance are imperative if viability is to be restored and if crisis to be uh, corrected or avoided. If the authorities delay action sufficiently, economic activity diminishes and ultimately political pressures force action. This may not happen perhaps until the economic activity has fallen drastically. It may happen sooner if the authorities can anticipate it. I was in Turkey in, in 1980 when the authorities had resisted what they could do for a long time. Uh, the result of which is that Turkey has no domestic oil and there had been no oil imports for several months at least. The harvest could not be collected. Everything else was just sitting there falling apart. There was no heating even in parliament, as indeed uh, the economy was simply grinding to a halt for lack of necessary inputs. It can happen, but finally, at some point, people say enough is enough. The point of all this is that as long as the country's obligations are, obligations are not, uh, creditors are not uh, confident that the obligations can and will be honored, difficulties will intensify. And confidence will not improve until measures are taken to correct the underlying macroeconomic imbalances that are resulting in the deteriorating situation. And that's important. And that's why there has to be a cutback. Hence, macroeconomic adjustments are a necessary component of restoring the sustainability. One of the chief complaints regarding the measures undertaken in some of the Eurozone countries has been that there is, quote, too much, unquote, austerity. While judgment is clearly needed for the, in determining the policies and the time path needed for adjustment, there must be sufficient austerity, i.e. a reduction in government expenditures and or increase in revenues and tightening of monetary policy to provide promises that imbalances will be brought under control and that the country can once again begin functioning in a way where its macroeconomic policies are stable and it can access international capital markets. In the absence of any external support, support notice this, Needed austerity would usually be greater and more immediate. Needed austerity in Greece would have been much greater in, uh, when the crisis finally hit, had the international community not lent, because the Greek fiscal deficit was 15% of GDP. About seven percentage points or less of that was uh, debt servicing obligations that were due. The others were payment of, of wages and salaries for civil servants, soldiers, etc., etc., and cutting those that drastically, a 7% cut, would make like this, make the sequester here look like child's play. It didn't happen, of course, because of the external financing. Uh, but given that, the necessity for foreign financing is part of the short-term tidying over once policies are adjusted or should be evident. When a country does reach a crisis situation, foreign financing enables a less paid <coughs> adjustment. When there's a depreciation in the currency, it takes time for exports and imports to respond. Foreign financing can buy that time. Likewise, increased revenues and or reduced government expenditures take time, as do asset sales, privatization. At the time when you're in a crisis, is absolutely the worst time to do it, quite aside from anything else. In most crisis situations, therefore, countries' leaders have turned to the IMF for financial support for an IMF program that spells out the policy corrections that will be undertaken to address the underlying imbalances and the financing that will be provided. Without the policy changes, the prospects would be for increasing imbalances, uh, with, and without the financial support, the resulting deflationary impact of policy adjustments, as I said, would be huge. One other aspect of adjustment should be noted. That has to do with the exchange rate. Few countries, except the very large ones, adopt an entirely freely floating exchange rate regime. In many countries with macroeconomic imbalances, currencies are either managed floats or fixed relative to another currency, such as Latvia was to the euro. They shadowed it. They were not formally fixed, but they followed it. In the periods of imbalance, policy temptation is usually to intervene in the foreign exchange market to suppress part or all of the pressures and to then to have to depreciate the currency at the time the crisis is ending in order to restore incentives for exporting 
and disincentives, if you like, for importing, and to hope, bring hope to restore the current account balance. In countries where the exchange rate has not been allowed to adjust to a realistic level uh, during the run-up to crisis, an exchange rate adjustment is a desirable part of an adjustment package in order to restore incentives, but also it can offset a significant part of the pressure for austerity that would otherwise result from fiscal and monetary tightening. An exchange rate change may not be a part of the policy package because the authorities choose to maintain the nominal rate, as happened in Latvia, or because, as in the euro area, exchange rate change is not or seen not to be an option. When that's the case, the needed monetary and fiscal correction for a given imbalance will necessarily be larger than it would be if an exchange rate adjustment could offset some part of it. So let me now turn to where we've been trying to get all this time, and that is to the role of debt. Debt can play a role in the build-up to the crisis and in crisis resolution in several ways. Sometimes borrowing has been undertaken in the private sector, usually in response to easy monetary policy, but proves uneconomic and the banks end up with balance sheets that must be replenished with government support, which in turn is financed by the issuance of new government debt. The fact that government that the debt is private and in the banking system, when it becomes non-performing loans, you may as well regard it as sovereign debt because that's effectively what most of it is. Sometimes uh, banks buy up bad debt, or the government buys up bad debt held by the bank and finances itself by borrowing <coughs> as it does so. Uh, there are many metrics by which the viability and sustainability of debt can be judged and all play a role. They include whether debt is public or private, whether it's denominated in domestic or foreign currency, whether it's held by domestic residents or foreigners, average maturity instructor. I'm going to simplify over that part of it enormously. I'm just going to assume that we are considering sovereign debt, the debt is denominated in foreign currency, and that spreads are rising sharply in the secondary bond market, while new issues to uh, roll over in finance current account deficits can be uh, issued only or floated only at prohibitive rates as the crisis unfolds. A key concept, and one that is often missed or misunderstood or ignored in public discussions, is that of debt sustainability. By debt sustainability, what economists mean is whether the sovereign will be able and willing to service debt obligations in the future if and when the economic activity should return to normal. To understand the issue, it is useful to start by thinking about uh, something that probably couldn't happen. But imagine a country, I suppose an individual, with no assets whose interest obligations, debt servicing obligations, on their debt is more than 100% of their income now and going forward. Quite clearly, they cannot pay debt. It's unsustainable. But, as I said, even, uh, it, it, as I said, in those cases, uh, we won't get there because long before that happens, as sovereign debt is rising and as debt service <coughs> obligations are not and as actions aren't taken, markets anticipate that will happen. Creditors refuse to roll over. So it doesn't mean that you have to have it truly unsustainable in the sense of more than 100% of GDP, which of course anyway is impossible because people have to at least eat or something. Uh, but at any event, debt becomes unsustainable when the prospective path going forward means that the country will not be able to raise sufficient funds to get back to voluntary uh, debt servicing. To, to understand where economists come from in this, it's useful to def define one concept which is useful, which is the primary surplus, which is defined as the difference between all sources of government revenue, which we shall call taxes, but there might be more, and non-interest expenditures. Of course, the sovereign can change the prospect of primary <coughs> surplus by cutting expenditures and perhaps raising tax rates, and it will need to. Uh, but there are limits to the amount by which this could be done. Once the prospect of primary surplus is known or projected several years forward, it defines the amount going forward that the sovereign will have available to finance its debt service obligations. If it's got government expenditures are so much and it has revenues for everything else and exactly the amount of the non-interest government expenditures, the primary surplus is zero. There will be no funding available to service interest on the debt, and debt next year will mount by the amount of those interest obligations if that can happen and the markets don't collapse on it. Uh, if, for example, a country's primary surplus next year will be minus 4% of GDP, the country would have to co cover that uh, with borrowing. And if, in addition, it has interest pay obligations, it has to cover those too. So the primary deficit plus the interest obligations would equal how much it have to borrow next year. 
Uh, to get this notion of sustainability, suppose that it has those, it has obligations of 90% of GDP, borrow at 4% because of the primary deficit. It must then borrow 13% of GDP. If its growth rate is 6%, its debt to GDP ratio will go by approximately 7%. Okay? Because the debt to GDP ratio is what most people look at. And so if you think of the interest as obligations as a percentage of GDP, plus whatever the new borrowing requirements are, minus then the growth rate is percentage, LDs is a percentage of GDP, you get sort of the path going forward. And if the primary surplus will not rise, and growth, <coughs> or growth will not rise, there are difficulties. Uh, obviously, the debt to GDP ratio cannot rise indefinitely, which is the definition of debt unsustainability. If the country's future prospects won't re permit a reduction in the primary deficit, and there's no reduction in the interest rate on the debt, as there will almost certainly not be in cases where this was a problem, the debt to GDP ratio will rise indefinitely, clearly unsustainable. I picked extreme numbers, of course. In Greece's case, however, the average interest rate on outstanding debt was just around 5%. Debt to GDP was then uh, just over 100%. And growth was not, would not expect to be over 2% in the future, i.e. Greek debt looked very unsustainable. Uh, now debt is up to 120% of GDP and still rising. The debt growth is forecast even this year to be negative. Uh, what about debt sustainability? There's another aspect to that issue, and that, of course, is the Greek already, Greece already had one restructuring. In that restructuring, <coughs> private credit is pretty much wiped out. Mostly, debt is to the official sector. Or to say it another way, what has happened to date has been that as Greece's obligations to private sector participants have become due, official lending has gone to Greece, which has been used to pay the private sectors, and so the private sector has been wiped out. The absence of any other mechanism to do it has led to a result where the taxpayers and the rest of the world pick up the burden. Uh, now, in fact, in the Greek case, policy package has included measures that would prospectively uh, raise growth rate over time, have included measures to cut anticipated government expenditures and raise tax revenues. And basically, the primary deficit has already been reduced from where it was to about 1% of GDP. And on optimistic assumptions, it could go to about zero this year, which of course still leaves the problem of the debt overhanging and everything else and low growth. But at least there have been some changes made. More generally, a country whose debt trajectory does not appear sustainable will not be able to roll over a service its outstanding obligations as private creditors refuse to roll over the debt to buy new ones. The appearance of sustainability is crucially important, and there is a widely varying range in which countries' macroeconomic policies would, if continued, result in unsustainability, and yet where potential creditors believe that policy corrections will be made. As those beliefs weaken, and as the situation persists, of course, and goes to crisis. As I already mentioned, the country's past record of honoring its obligations is also important. But if the debt-to-GDP ratio continues rising and insufficient policy action is undertaken, creditors will demand their higher spreads, and there we go. To conclude this before I get to what we do about the international architecture, the main point to stress is that policies undertaken to restore credit worthiness in international markets are doomed to failure if it is judged that inadequate corrective policies will be undertaken uh, and there are unsustainable debt levels. And corrective macroeconomic policies will not work if the debt level is judged unsustainable and not corrected. The two they have to fit together. And it has been the job of the IMF to try and make that fit with other uh, slending and so on along the way. And one of the things the Europeans learned in the Greek crisis was that indeed they needed the IMF because they did not have the technology to figure it all out. It is difficult technology. But let me now turn to the international arch uh, economic architecture. At present, the official international community does not interfere in the restructuring of sovereign debt to private creditors leaving that to be agreed between the debtor and the creditors. The official community does, however, enter into the equation through the IMF. The IMF, by its articles, cannot lend unless there's a strong prospect that the country's altered monetary fiscal exchange rate and other policies will return the country uh, to re enable the country to regain access to the private international financial market within a reasonable period of time, normally three years or so. To do that requires that within three years or so, the primary surface will be large enough and the debt will be such that indeed the debt servicing obli obligations incurred in the private market uh, can be met. 
And as already seen, without some funding, when policies are adjusted, the feasibility of a country meeting its short-term obligations is severely impaired. They've got to get exports flowing and all that, and that's the IMF role in finance. <coughs> but without policy reforms, the outlook for growth is grim. The current account trajectory looks bad, and fiscal imbalances are negative. So the IMF cannot devise a program which gives without, unless it gives a promise of sustainability, and the factors leading to crisis would simply lead to further imbalances. Hence, pressure can arise on debtors and creditors alike to reach an agreement on restructuring in one or a combination of ways that I talked about. The creditors confided in their interest, uh, as otherwise default might render their holdings valueless. Without restructuring and policy reform, the situation might deteriorate further, and the write down of existing obligations would be even greater. When the domestic economic situation becomes sufficiently dire, policymakers finally recognize the infeasibility of maintaining debt service and normally decide to enter into negotiations. And there are negotiations between private uh, credit, uh, creditors and the sovereign debtor. However, some restructurings have been delayed for long periods, during which countries' economies languished with output growing slowly, if at all, and debt burdens rising. The delay has come about for a variety of reasons. Political leaders may be and often are overly optimistic uh, that good fortune or an increase of, in one or more export commodity prices, accelerated growth or the like, may improve the outlook sufficiently. They may or may not, and often do refuse to recognize the reality of the existing situation. I have met very many intelligent policymakers who were in a state of complete denial as well to what was happening as spreads on their, uh, on their outstanding uh, new issues were rising rapidly. Uh, denial is a frequent phenomenon, and difficulties and uncertainties surrounding the likely structure and course of restructuring negotiations may and seem to often defer initiating uh, restructuring procedures. There are also other potential issues, such as the likelihood of holdout creditors and how that will affect restructuring prospects. For some or all of these reasons, restructuring may be delayed long past the point where outside conservers have concluded it's inevitable, and for a period where loss of economic output in the country is hurting the value of the creditors' claims and hurting the country as well. Recently, that was certainly the case in the Greek, Greek restructuring of early 2011, and some would argue this happening again as the restruct more restructuring is inevitable. In many other cases, refusal to recognize the need for restructuring has delayed things for quite a while. This is significant because once it becomes inevitable, <coughs> economic activity is really dampened, recession generally sets in and intensifies. Recommendations have been made as to how to address this issue. When a private institution within a country is facing prospect of insolvency, bankruptcy legislation governs the ways in which to proceed. There may there are cases where a firm could be a going concern if only its finances were restructured, and it's to the interest of creditors and debtors alike to do that, and to prevent the rush for the door that will other happen, otherwise happen among the creditors who will try to get out first. Uh, the, these <coughs> bankruptcy procedures could be used uh, both to prevent creditors from running for the exits, <coughs> preserving the institution as a going concern when desirable, and so on. Internationally, there has been no such corresponding set of procedures. To be sure that sovereigns are, uh, sovereigns are sovereign, so that the assets cannot be sold off without their agreement. In that regard, sovereign indebtedness differs from domestic indebtedness, but it bears similarities in that creditors can try to get rid of their holdings and create the international equivalent of a bank run on a country's currency. This has been recognized for some time. It has further been recognized that the international financial architecture has not had a mechanism for reducing economic losses associated with sovereign debt, this is when there is unsustainable debt. If a country experiences short-term difficulties, perhaps due to crop failure, cyclical drop in its export prices, the IMF, an IMF package can be devised without any debt restructuring or at most some rephasing of outstanding debt. <coughs> and in these cases, creditors anyway are normally willing to roll over. But when debt sustain unsustainability is an issue, the situation changes. The problem must be addressed before the crisis can be resolved. In the 1980s, the G 1990s, sorry, the G10 recognized that the losses were unnecessarily large from delays and what have you in restructuring, and recommended in 1996 that collective action clauses, CACs, be placed in sovereign bond contracts issued in foreign currency. <coughs> CICs and bond contracts commit the creditor 
to consent to a restructuring if a critical threshold of bondholders of the issue vote to accept the, uh, the debtor's restructuring offer. When the G10 proposed CACs to address the restructuring problem, the international community did not act and ignored the suggestion. But in the early 2000s, in the wake of the Asian crisis, in <coughs> Russia and Turkey, the issue arose again. At that time, the IMF put forward a proposal for sovereign debt restructuring, <coughs> which could be entered into after a treaty was agreed upon to amend the IMF articles, under which sovereign debt difficulties might be resolved with a more predictable procedure and perhaps with lower less delay. The proposal was debated for a year and a half, <coughs> but at that time it failed to receive sufficient support to go forward. <coughs> Instead, CACs were endorsed and be began being placed in bond contracts. CACs may well address part of the problems that have arisen when sovereign debt is truly unsustainable, as they, have mit they can mitigate holdout problems by requiring all holders of an individual issue to agree to restructuring if more than usually 75% of the holders vote to do so. There can also be, in some issues, <coughs> for some countries, a requirement that a higher threshold of all bondholders may vote across issues, which would then obviate the one or two bondholders that did not accept it so that you could force the others into it if that's in the bond contract. At the time that this was discussed, the American administration argued that, quote, the private market can resolve the issue. You can't imagine how many times I heard that. Uh, which made one wonder why the private market needed to resolve some insolvencies within a country, uh, but not between them. One could, of course, make the same claim about domestic firms, but almost everyone would agree that the appropriate insolvency regime, and I mean appropriate, there's some very bad ones, require, reduces the economic cost of firms' failures to creditors and debtors alike. A strong case can, I believe, be made that an international solvency regime along the lines proposed in the SDRM discussion could reduce costs of crises in the context of unsustainability and hence increase world welfare. To date, CACs have hardly been tested. Older issues do not have CAC clauses within them, although they have been required under UK law for a number of years. And there are potential difficulties in that holders of one or more issues might vote against the restructuring. This might happen, for example, if uh, one or two wealthy people bought up a particular issue of the bond, uh, which, which would then block, could block it, unless you had the uh, collective across bond clauses. It could also happen if a vulture fund were to buy up more than 25% of a particular issue of the secondary market, or if several vulture funds uh, colluded to do so. There are also other concerns about CACs. What would happen to a sovereign's bank debt? It's not covered in any bond clauses. What would happen to it in the event there were a restructuring? How long would the voting mechanisms take uh, and how what, what, and how to delay restructuring across the AC issues? It's too early to tell how real these concerns are. There's also the matter of treatment of holdout creditors. Yesterday, the New York court, under whose ju jurisdiction many bonds have been issued, the appeals court, held an, on appeal a hearing by Argentina against a ruling, which Marcus mentioned, under which sovereign creditors who have restructured the debt may not service any new debt unless they service holdout debt in the same proportion, which would generally mean payment of principal and accrued interest in all cases, on the uh, <coughs> holdout debt. Uh, if that ruling holds, the incentive for becoming a holdout would increase greatly, uh, and it's doubtful whether you get the 75% threshold in CAC issues, but that has a long way to go. When the SCRM was first proposed, it was intended to address the holdout problem, as well as to facilitate timely debt restructuring and hence reduce the economic costs of delay. It received support from many countries, but it would have required more than 85% of the shares of votes in the IMF in order to take effect. <coughs> After the F SCRM proposal had been discussed and altered in several ways to reduce some concerns about it, the United States made it known that it would vote against it if it came to the executive board. And since the United States held more than 15% of the shares in the fund, the proposal was withdrawn uh, by fund management. The euro area crises and the high level of indebtedness of the peripheral countries have once again led to concerns about unsustainable sovereign debt. Bruegel, the EU-based think tank, proposed a European sovereign debt structuring mechanism early in the crisis. 
and a resolution mechanism is now in the process of development. While a European mechanism and experience might set an example for the global community to follow, experience it with it will be sometime in the future, and the treatment outside the Eurozone of creditors <coughs> is something of an issue for what would be done there, and I have not as yet seen a discussion of how that would evolve in any satisfactory way. In the meantime, I can be, it can be argued that the international financial architecture certainly needs strengthening to address the issue of unsustainable sovereign debt and its treatment. The complacency that existed about the immunity of industrial countries from sovereign debt crises has certainly been shaken, if not destroyed by the Eurozone experience. But while the crisis has once again focused attention on the issue, there seems to be little movement to date to lead to a consensus on strengthening the architecture. Of course, one can hope that CACs and adoption of reasonably prudent macroeconomic policies will do the job and that no further action will be needed. But if past experience is any guide, future crises entailing sovereign debt will happen with greater losses in welfare than are necessary. Thank you very much.